time to welcome you all uh, to our conference on the biopolitical condition. Some of you, some of us, uh, have traveled quite a long way, and we are grateful to have you here with us, especially given the strangeness uh, of the East Coast weather. <laughs> The idea for this conference uh, came out of a discussion that I had with Chiara uh, last June in the intense uh, heat of mid-summer in New York. Uh, in this discussion, we asked ourselves why the term biopolitics has become so pervasive, maybe so fashionable, in so many discursive registers. Why are we seeing there such a proliferation of terms Biopower, biocapitalism, bio law, bio weapons, uh, bio everything. Does this proliferation signal something new? Do these terms compose a new paradigm through which we can better understand our present? And if it's so, what transformations does this paradigm help us to detect? So the only answer we could come up with was that if biopolitics, in Michel Foucault's sense of the term, had a very precise meaning, contemporary scholars have enlarged this sense to such a great extent that we no longer know precisely what it designates, or for that matter, what is at stake in it. We thought that the best way to confront uh, uh, this issue was to bring together excellent scholars from different fields in order to explore the map uh, and determine. As soon as we began to plan the conference, we immediately asked the anthropology department, in addition, of course, to the philosophy department, to collaborate with us. And since many Italian scholars are involved in the investigation around biopolitics, we then turned to, to the Italian Cultural Institute and the Center Bios of my own university of Piedmont, or East Piedmont. So one technicality, unfortunately, uh, Roberto Esposito cannot be here today, uh, but the paper that uh, he wrote for us uh, can be distributed so we, we we will then have a, a longer lunch break and reconvene here at 2, more or less, 2 p.m. So I hope you enjoy the discussion and thank you. Simona, uh, I think you're different. I have a much better answer about what biopolitics is all about. <laughs> and so I have the privilege of uh, <laughs> introducing somebody who embodies it. See, as I will explain. I mean, Piata is an unusual person, and so I'm going to give an unusual introduction. Piata uh, uh, has, been, has, has been a sheer gift uh, to the new school. Uh, she came to us uh, three years ago, you know, and I think has been a major force in helping to transform philosophy and the new school. She comes from the European Institute by way of Frankfurt to us, and what did she bring? She brought both imagination and mythos, <laughs> you know, thing. and as I think most of you know, and you can read, she's written a magnificent book on the politics of myth, and and then equally, I've, since I've read it, an interesting, fascinating book on it, which goes from the Greeks right up to the present. So that she seems to me to embody, first of all, the politics of imagination, <laughs> politics of myth, and is the biopolitics. Ever since that uh, Chiara has come to the new school with her husband, Benoit, the cuisine at the new school has gone way up. She feeds the body. So if you take the politics and you take the body, you have to be honest. <laughs> okay. You're too kind. Um, genealogy of politics, from its invention to the biopolitical turn, I must admit, I will begin with the Greeks again. But before the paper, I have to make a confession. I am a smoker. I know it's dangerous for my health, but I smoke and I enjoy it. 
The relationship that I have with the philosopher I will be engaging with my paper is similar to the one that I have to smoking. I know that for somebody with feminist sympathies like myself to keep reading Aristotle, Hobbes, and Spinoza is dangerous, potentially even intoxicating. But I keep reading and enjoying them. The reflections that follow must be understood within this context. I will try to set up a genealogy of politics in order to illuminate the meaning of its biopolitical turn, and in doing so, I will mainly be referring to those dead white males that make up the so-called Western philosophical canon. But hopefully, something will also emerge of my more or less failed attempt to keep smoking. So this is the confession of the people. Let's begin with Mephistopheles. In a scene from Goethe's Faust, Mephistopheles observes, quote, for just where meaning fails, you see, a new word will come in, good and neat. So new words come in where meaning fails. We create new words or start using them in a different way when the vocabulary available no longer suffices. Now, if it is true that a new series of words, constructed with the suffix bio, has recently entered our vocabulary, the question emerges, what is the failure of meaning that you responded to? What was politics before, and what has it become after the biopolitical term? To address this question, I will reconstruct the major breaks in the genealogy of politics as it emerges in our Western tradition. In this enterprise, I will be relying to a great extent on philology and philologists. I know some of you don't like them. So for tormenting you with a lot of details from two dead languages, Greek and Latin, I found no better apology than the words of Nietzsche. Nietzsche, who in the preface to Daybreak, invites us not to read him unless we are philologists. Why? For Nietzsche, to be good readers, means to be philologists. I quote, for philology is that venerable art which demands of its votaries one thing above all, to go aside, to take time, to become still, to become slow. It's a goldsmith art and connoisseurship of the word which is nothing but delicate, cautious work to do and achieves nothing if does not achieve it lento. So here it comes, lento, very lento, the genealogy of politics I would like to propose you today. It's very well known that the meaning of the term politics has significantly changed from one epoch to the other. While Arendt could still write in the 60s that the experience of the Greek polis from which the word politicos derives will stay with us as long as we keep using the word politics, other authors have identified major ruptures in our understanding of politics, which have brought the term far afield of the Greeks. I would like to focus here on two major ruptures. The first occurs with the invention of the term politics itself. Despite its Greek derivation from the adjective politikos, generally indicating whatever concerns the polis, the use of the substantive politics is to a great extent, a modern invention. This is an old story for historians and philologists, but it's a story that we tend to forget. Politics has not always been there. The rupture most clearly emerges if we consider that the ancient Greeks did not have a single substantive to denote a specific kind of activity within the more general sphere of the public. For them, there existed the polis, the typically ancient Greek city-state they lived in, as well as the adjective politikos, denoting the thing pertaining to the affairs of the city-state. This means that the realm of, pol of the polis was conceived to be coextensive with the entirety of public life, and not as indicating a specific kind of activity within the public sphere. The more abstract terms used by the Greeks to indicate what we would call politics were expressions such as politike techne, which denotes the art of leading political affairs, and ta politika, the plural substantivized adjective literally meaning the things concerning the polis. But both expressions refer to the sphere of the, pol <coughs> the polis, 
uh, broadly understood as the site of public life in contrast to private life, and not to a specific kind of activity within it. As a consequence, it is not an exaggeration to say that the Greeks, to which so many philosophers attributed the invention of politics itself, did not have a word to designate it. This, of course, does not mean that one cannot use their own experience as a model for what politics is or should be. You can have the thing and not name it, or you can have it and name it differently. However, we should be aware that when we speak about the ancient Greek understanding of politics, we do so with a word that was invented at a much later stage. Strictly speaking, it's an anachronism. And this invention, seen as if something new had in the meanwhile emerged, which the available vocabulary was insufficient to designate. By contrast, in their own daily usage, ancient Greek felt that the polis, the concrete space where they exercised their public life, was, suffi was sufficient to indicate the activities we normally term politics. When they wanted to speak about it in more abstract terms, they did not feel the need for politics, but most often use an expression, ta politica, that denotes both the things relative to the polis and the knowledge about it. This is a point worth emphasizing. The expression used by the Greek to indicate politics means both the thing itself and the knowledge about it. The term techne in ancient Greek does not only mean a neutral technique, but also implies knowledge. Equally, ta politica is a term that is also used to refer to the books written about the polis, as is well known. Ta politica was the title given to Aristotle books on what we would call politics, and as we will see, it is to a great extent thanks to the influence of such a book that the term polis, poli, politics has entered our vocabulary. This should not come as a surprise if we consider that Aristotle famously defined the human being as a zone politicon, precise in this book, thereby grounding the existence of what we would call politics in human nature itself. As we read in the famous passage that defines the human beings as a political animal, zone politicon, the polis is a natural growth, so much so that whoever lives without it must be either below or above the scale of humanity. We will discuss later the implication of defining the human being as a zone politicon. For the time being, it's sufficient to know that even here, ta politica denotes both the thing and the knowledge about it. The lack of a word for politics in ancient Greek is something that cannot but strike any careful craftsman of words. Even more puzzling is the complete absence of such a word from classical Latin. The ancient Romans, according to some, the most political of the people, did not, did not feel the need for the world politics either. This may be due to the fact that the Romans were so political that for their linguistic universe, politics occupied the entire, entirety of public life, and thus they did not feel the need to distinguish it uh, from other spheres of uh, the life in common. This would suggest that for both the Greeks and the Romans, the semantic field corresponding to what we would call politics today was so broad that they could not even name it. Nevertheless, it remains a striking fact that in classical Latin, there is not even the adjective politicus, the term that literally corresponds to the Greek politikos. Indeed, politicus appear only once in the whole uh, corpus of classical Latin writings as an unusual Grecism, whereas the substantive politica, corresponding to our politics, enter into common usage only in the Middle Ages, after the translation of Aristotle's books on politics. This is perhaps the most puzzling twist in our story so far. The Romans, these eminently political people who imported so many things from the Greek almost everything, did not feel the need to import politicos. Like the Greeks, they did not have the substantive that corresponds to our politics. However, neither did they have an adjective 
corresponding to our political, for which the Greek had their own native politicals. The Romans had their own words, and perhaps also their own different things. They had the adjective civilis, publicus, socialis, literally meaning civil, public, and social. Such words were enough for them to accu accurately designate what they wanted to say about politics. The substantive polis was indeed rendered by the Romans with civitas and societas, a usage that is still attested in early modern sources. And instead of politics, they notoriously made use of other terms such as res publica, the public thing, publica negotia, public affairs, and the res civilis, the civil thing. The, as I said before, the only attested use of the term politicus in classical Latin is a passage by Cicero where he speaks about the political philosopher, politici philosophy, but here political denotes not the thing but rather the knowledge, again, about it. Note also that, uh, as I said before, that this usage was perceived as an eccentric and unusual gracism, which remained without a sequel. In general, the Romans did not feel the need for it. For them, the space of what we would, we would call politics was adequately covered by other terms. The fact that this space of the political was thought in terms of publicus, civilis, and socialis is very significant. Together with civitas, literally the city, the Roman translated the Greek polis with the term societas, which like the corresponding adjective socialis comes from socius, meaning ally, associate, and partner. This is an important innovation because it's the first step towards the birth of the social and thus of the distinction between society and politics. Yet, as both are still thought in terms of publicus, we can conclude that the Romans did not conceive of politics as a separate field within the more general uh, public and social sphere. At least, they did not perceive such a distinction so crucial as to name it. I will not enter into the details of the birth of politics, what is important to emphasize is the fact it is a modern invention. In this respect, the rupture from previous usages could not be greater. For some, this path-breaking innovation is the result of the curious fact that when Willem von Moerbeke translated Aristotle's books on politics into Latin, he did not use the standard words that Latin used for century but directly imported from Greek the terms politicus and politica, corresponding to our term politics. Among the terms imported by von Morbeke, there is thus not just the adjective politicus, but also the substantive politica, a very centric translation for the time. Yet, I would say, one, it was meant to be full of decisive consequences. Sternenberger attributes this unusual choice to the fact that von Morbeke was probably not so sure about the precise meaning of those terms and decided to leave them in the original Greek form with a slightly Latinized version, politicus instead of politica, politicos and politica instead of ta politica. Now the question emerges, is the birth of politics just the result of an inaccuracy in translation. Even if this interpretation is correct, and the actual birth of politics ultimately derives from a bad translation, the fact that he didn't know his script that well, this still does not explain why the term politica, and therefore politics, successfully eclipsed the more Lucius Latin words that writers had used for more than a millennia. Furthermore, the very fact that von Morbeke was uncertain about their usage is perhaps also the sign that something new had in the meanwhile emerged. The political world of the 13th century Europe could not be rendered through the words that the Roman and Latin Christianity had used for 
centuries. Now, however, despite the appearance of the term politica in the 13th century with von Morbeke, and the fact that this brought with it a new series of arguments for thinking about what we can call the autonomy of politics, we should not forget that for quite some time, the Latin term politica, the for politics, kept being used in the ancient meaning of the art or science of government. Like the corresponding term physics, economics, and ethics, the term politics denoted the words devoted to the study of the polis and not the thing itself. As late as the beginning of the 17th century, Johannes Althusius would still call his major work about the foundation of the Consociatio Politica, what we would call today the state, precisely Politica Methodica Digesta, literally meaning the science of politics, Methodica Digesta. This testified to the great importance that Aristotle politics had in our tradition, so much so that it doesn't appear exaggerate to say with Arendt that the experience of the Greek, is, of the, uh, the Greek polis will stay with us as long as we keep using the word politics. However, it was not until the modern epoch that we began to use the word politics. And this is largely because it was only after the Middle Ages that politics began to be perceived as an autonomous domain. According to some interpreters, the decisive moment for the birth of politics, thus understood, was the revolution initiated at the dawn of modernity by the theorists of reason of state, beginning with Botero. With this expression, reason of state, Botero was referring to the knowledge of the appropriate means to establish, maintain, and enlarge a state defined as a firm empire over a people. <coughs> For some, it is only with this revolution that the term politics ceases to have its ancient meaning of civil philosophy and instead assumes the specifically modern meaning of the art of enlarging and preserving a state and thus of the thing itself. In other words, behind the fortune of a translator's seemingly chance introduction of the term politica into Latin, there is the puzzlement that emerged in response to a political novelty, that of the sovereign state, of a firm domain over a people within clearly defined territorial boundaries. The modern state, which appears in Europe between the 16th and 17th century, was indeed an unprecedented form of political community whose novelty is more st strongly manifest if one considers that medieval Europe had been characterized for centuries by a chaotic and overlapping system of authorities, where no political power could ever claim sovereign authority over a defined boundaries. It's only then to designate and emphasize the novelty that the passage from a knowledge of the thing, politics as civil philosophy, to the thing itself, politics as the activity concerning the affair of the polis, polis took place. <coughs> Note that despite what is usually assumed, it took a long time before the term politics affirmed itself. In the 16th century, Machiavelli, to whom many attributed the invention of the modern concept of politics in its autonomy from both ethics and religion, does not use the word politica, or politics, at all. However, this should not come as a surprise if we consider that Thomas Hobbes, one of the first, perhaps the greatest, theorists of the sovereign state, when referring to what we would call politics, followed the traditional Latin usage and speaks about the commonwealth, literally the res publica. So if it is true that Hobbes, as to a great extent, invented English philosophical language, since before him, Latin was the official language for philosophy, then we have to conclude that politics was not yet an integral part of it. Wherever one locates the birth of politics, it's clear that the use of the term implied a significant shrinkage of the semantic field previously designated by older terms. 
the passage from the Greek adjective politikos to the substantive, as it appears in different European languages, meant therefore also significant restriction of the semantic field of politics. Politics no longer meant the whole of public, civil, and social life as it was conveyed by classical sources, but just one, one section of it. There is neither space nor the need for discussing the details of the vicissitude of the modern term politics. Let me just point out that by the time Max Weber takes up the term at the beginning of the 20th century, it's reduced to its minimal semantic core. No longer a knowledge about the whole public life, but rather a small part of the thing itself. That peculiar kind of power characterized by the potential recourse to the use of legitimate <coughs> physical coercion. Weber was obsessed with definitions, so much so that I guess his mastodontic economy and society can be described as an attempt to provide definitions for every aspect of our social life. This, together with the fact that it is one of the founding fathers of sociology, explain why his definition <coughs> has been so prominent in the literature. For our genealogy, it is important to note that the success of a definition of politics that linked it to the state is inseparable from the fact that it clearly reflected a change occurring in political life itself. It's because of the emergence of the modern state that people felt the need for a new world. People confronted with what politics had become within modern nation state felt a sense of novelty. And politics was the term that they have chosen to convey this sense of novelty. As I mentioned before, Weber's definition is still very influential, but not least, I would say, because it's uh, the most frequent in our common language. This is, for instance, the definition that you read in the Oxford English Dictionary. The centrality of the notion of the state in the common understanding of politics may be due to the fact that the sovereign state appeared for centuries as the culminating point of our political life, as the privileged object of inquiry for political theorists. Yet, we should not forget that the modern state is a relatively recent discovery in the history of humanity, and most relevantly, one that has been limited to European modernity for a long time. <coughs> Exported to the rest of the world to the European colonialism, the division of the whole world into national state does not predate, actually, the second half of the 20th century. It is a very recent innovation, and one that may also turn out to be particularly short-lived if talks about the end of the sovereign state system are to be taken seriously. Maybe they're wrong, maybe the sovereign state system is not dead, but it doesn't seem to be in a very healthy condition either. So maybe there's something to, to be said. Going back to our story, vis-a-vis -vis such a restricted use of politics, many felt constrained. The resistance to this constraint heralds the second break within the genealogy of uh, politics to which I will now turn. Different authors, in the belief that something had been lost, look to classical antiquity to expand the concept again. Among them, perhaps most notable is Anna Arendt, who saw in the Athenian model of democracy the epitome of what real politics is about. Arendt attributes to the Greek the invention of politics, whereas she sees in modernity the modern of the rise of the social, illustrated in exemplary fashion by the emergence of the social question. It should be evident by now that, from a philological point of view, this is, properly speaking, an anachronism, because the Greeks did not have a word for politics. In other words, modernity could give birth to the social only because it had also given birth to politics itself. We'll come back to Arendt later on, but for the moment, what I want to emphasize uh, is the fact that um, there has been an attempt to widen the scope of the term politics, um, which is signaled in Arendt by the return to the ancient, uh, but also by other um, linguistic novelty. One is uh, the, uh, the emergence of the expression the political, and the second is the emergence of the expression biopolitics. 
beginning with the political. The term the political gesture clearly at a return to the adjective, which, as we have seen, extends back a long way from modernity. However, the emphasis this time is on the substantivized form, the political, not just political. Now, what are the consequences of this change of words? As politics change again up to a point that other words are needed to indicate such a novelty, it's perhaps too early to say whether the fortune of the term the political will continue and eventually replace that of politics, but it is clear that the recourse to the expression the political signals an insufficiency of the vocabulary available. Reflecting on the meaning of this shift from politics to the political, Rosanne Vallon argues that this, is indeed, that this indeed implies a deep change of perspective from politics as the Weberian struggle for the monopoly of legitimate coercion within modern state to, ex to an examination of the background of the ontological conditions for the existence of politics. Some authors following Carl Schmitt found such conditions in the couple friend and enemy, whereas others, such as Rosanne Vallon, prefers to identify it with what he calls le cadre d'ensemble, all that constitutes a city, cité, above and beyond institutional life. In both cases, however, the result is an enlargement and a shift of emphasis toward a more context-oriented framework. Whereas the term politics indicates the thing itself, the political is meant to signal a renewed emphasis on the background, on the conditions that have to be met in order for formal politics to take place. But together with the, with the expression of the political, a new term has recently appeared on the scene, biopolitics. Finally, we get there. In the last few decades, there has been a diffuse perception of a radical novelty that perhaps explained the proliferation of so many words, biopolitics, governmentality, instead of government or governance. This is a bunch of new words out there. Some have proved to be more resilient than others, and I think biopolitics is one of them. The term has gained prominence in contemporary debate, along with all the corresponding terms constructed with the suffix bio, bioethics, bio-law, biomedicine, biotechnology, and now even bioterrorism, are all new words that point to a different, or at least a more significant role of the notion of life itself. Not that despite the huge differences with the ancient, the concept of biopolitics maintains on the one hand the modern attention to the institutional mechanism of power while at the same time enlarging it uh, so as to include a kind of knowledge as it was the case for the ancient meaning. To put it bluntly, politics is both for Weber and Foucault something that has to do with power but with this fundamental difference that for Foucault power is pervasive precisely because it's inseparable from knowledge. As a consequence, like the political, the term biopolitics also denotes a semantic enlargement. As well known, Foucault introduced the term to denote a change in the nature of modern political power. In his view, while traditional sovereignty has always been a power aimed at controlling life by threatening with it with the possibility of death, the new form of power that emerges in the mid-19th century is that of a power aimed at inciting and preserving life. While the sovereign power, not by chance symbolized by this word, was essentially a power to kill, a power to take life or let it die, the new biopower manifests itself as a power to make life and let die. Hence, the increased significance of biological life as the medium where political power displays itself. In Foucault's analysis, it's indeed in the 19th century that the power hold over life emerges. This would be the moment when the biological came under state control, or at least the moment when the tendency towards state control of the biological emerges. The rise of biopolitics is thus manifested, as well known, 
in the systematic inclusion of disciplines such as demography, public hygiene, birth control, etc., in the practice of government itself. This change attests to an, an attempt by political power to directly control life, no longer <coughs> by simply threatening to inflict death, the power of the sword, but also by inciting, promoting, in a word, by disciplining life. Now, why in Foucault's, view, in Foucault's view, there is therefore an opposition between classical forms of sovereignty and biopolitics, according to other interpreters of the biopolitical term, the latter began with modernity itself. Far from bringing a break in the modern paradigm, biopolitics is inscribed in its very bones from the beginning. According to George Agamben, the paradox of modern sovereignty is precisely that it has always been at the same time within and outside of the juridical order, because its power derives from its capacity to decide on the state of perception, and thus to inflict death. While the modern paradigm, at least since Hobbes, has justified its own existence in terms of its capacity to guarantee the security of its citizen, Agamben shows the striking paradox that lies the very origins of this move. The sovereign is the sovereign because it can guarantee our security by potentially killing us with impunity. Precisely because of its capacity to exercise from the beginning its power over life, Agamben observes that the modern sovereignty is from the beginning biopolitical. As he put it, quote, Contrary to our modern habit of representing the political realm in terms of citizens' right, free will, and social contract, from the point of view of sovereignty, only bare life is authentically political. This is why in Hobbes, the foundation of sovereign power is to be sought not in the subject free renunciation to their natural right, but in the sovereign preservation of his natural right to do anything to anyone which now appear as the right to punish. Agamben can thus claim that, the authentically that authentically political is bare life itself, since the sovereign who retains the, the right to kill with impunity is at the same time inside and outside the juridical order. This is evident in its capacity to decide on the state of exception that makes the Nazi concentration camp not a deviation from modernity, but rather the epitome of its very biopolitical nature. Thus, whereas according to Agamben, the ancient Greeks could still distinguish between zoe, bare life, and bios, the qualified life, this possibility would be lost for us because life itself has become the political question par excellence. Despite the fact that Agamben locates the birth of biopolitics at the beginning of modernity, it therefore agrees with Foucault's fundamental insight, that is, the fact that whereas for millennia man remained what it was for Aristotle, that is, a living animal with additional capacity for political existence, the modern man is an animal whose politics places his own existence as a living being in question the famous reversal of Aristotle's passage. Now, by chance, then, the racism of the kind uh, we have witnessed with Nazism is for both authors the culminating point of the biopolitical term. Nazism took the interplay between the sovereign right to kill and the mechanism of biopower that is inscribed in the working of every state to the point of the extermination camp. Otherwise stated, for both authors, Biopolitics is ultimately a form of thanatopolitics. But is this the only way to think about biopolitics? Does biopolitics always negate life while sustaining it? Here comes the more constructive part of my paper, if you want. Roberto Esposito has tried to reverse this thanatopolitical paradigm in, into its opposite and thus to elaborate an affirmative model of biopolitics that configure itself not as a politics over life, sulla vita, but as a politics of life, della vita. The three sides where Nazism dis displayed its power, the body, the birth, and the norm, 
can all be recast in affirmative terms according to Exposito. At the end of his uh, book, Bios, he tries to do so by drawing inspiration from different strands of Vitalistic philosophy. However, in my view, he ultimately does not succeed in this task because he remains captive of the Hobbesian paradigm that links the existence of the political community to the possibility of death. This is because since his earlier work on the notion of community, Esposito has thought of community, communitas, as the possibility of living cum munus, that is, with munus, meaning at the same time gift and obligation that we have towards the other when contemplating the possibility of death. Despite the fact that Esposito reverses the traditional thinking of the community from many points of view, I think he still remains attached to the idea that this being in common of the community is defined by our own fragility in face of the possibility of death. One may suspect that there is here a kind of Heideggerian heritage lurking deep in his thinking. It would be nice to have him here to discuss it. But it may also be an attitude that goes far back in the past. As women philosopher from Arendt to Cavarero, who's here today, have noticed, most male philosophers, at least since Plato, look at human beings as beings towards death. Very rarely did they take the opposite perspective of looking at them as being after birth, a puzzling fact on its own ground given the ontological priority of birth over death. For while it is true that we are always beings toward death, it's equally true that we are so precisely because we are in the first place beings after birth. Philosophers like to remind us of the first truth, that we're going to die, but they tend to forget of the second one, that we're actually born. If we look at biopolitics, from this perspective, a different strand of considerations come to the fore. I will concentrate on two consequences. In the first place, we should notice that what is authentically political is life itself, not because it's killable, as Agamben argues, but because it is born. From Hobbes to Weber, and thus from its very birth, politics has all too often been conceived in relationship to the possibility of death. Obsessed with the latter as the defining feature of our existential horizon, modern philosophers have neither been able to wrest themselves from this heritage, nor to find a more powerful justification for the existence of sovereign power than attributing to it the guarantee of our security, vis-a-vis -vis the possibility of death. This emphasis on the possibility of death has led us to neglect the crucial political role that life itself has always had. The conservation of life and its needs has always been at the center of our life in common, so much so that we can say that, to a certain extent, politics has always been biopolitics. Even in Aristotle, the distinction between the household, the oikos, and the sphere of the polis does not mean that life has no role to play in the polis, Life and its needs are central to politics because without them, there could not be life in common in the first place. And I think it's not by chance that both Plato and Aristotle agree that the polis derives from the satisfaction of needs, that is, from the fact that we are incapable of providing for our life and our most basic needs in isolation. Aristotle was very well aware of the centrality of life as seen in the fact that when he defines a man as the zon politicon, he uses an expression, zon, which literally means the living being. The Latin rendering of zon as animal is misleading in my view, because the term, first of all, because the term animal has a connotation of inferiority, which is not necessarily uh, implied by zon. On the contrary, zon, which derives from zoe, life itself, simply means any living being, any ensouled being, as Jonas argues. Even Aristotle was very well aware of the fact that we can be political beings 
precisely because we are living beings, or what we, is the same because we are actually born. By inverting the Foucauldian rephrasing of Aristotle, we can therefore conclude that man has always been a creature in world politics, its existence as a living being was in question. Or, as I was stated, in world politics, the very fact that he was born is at stake. And we come here to the second point that I would like to emphasize in this kind of reversal of the thanatopolitical version of biopolitics. Life has always been at the center of politics, not only because life and its needs are crucial political issues, but also because birth, as Are, again with Cavarero, reminds us, is the political moment par excellence. If it is true that death is a moment when we are necessarily alone, whereas birth is always in common, then we have to conclude that birth, not death, should be at the center of our thinking about politics. We can die more or less surrounded by our people, we may even commit collective suicide, but it's a fact that our body is, dies alone, whereas birth is always accompanied. There's no birth which is not in common. If politics then has to do with our social life, with the fact that our passage on this earth is accompanied by the presence of others, we must conclude that birth comes well before death as a crucial political moment. The fact that this basic truth has so often been neglected does not, only, does not only have to do with the circumstance that most philosophers, historically speaking, are male. Mm -hmm. Having gone through the experience of birth only at the beginning of their life, it's all too easy to understand why they tend to forget about it. A different genealogy of politics would probably have been written if women had, a large, had played a larger role within it. This brings me to a, a striking paradox. The person who most emphatically stressed the importance of birth as the political moment par, par excellence is a woman, Are, who nevertheless would have dismissed the word biopolitics as a contradiction in terms. In a rightly famous passage, which goes against a few millennia of political philosophical speculation, Arendt states, quote, since action is the political activity par excellence, natality and not mortality may be the central category of political as distinguished from metaphysical thought. This passage does not only show that Arendt was very well aware of the fact that politics has to do with the condition of plurality, that is, with men as a plurality of individuals of the same species. For Arendt, politics depends on birth because it depends on the possibility of action, understood as the capacity to bring about the new. <coughs> it is in this sense that she can, for instance, write that natality, quote, is the miracle that saves the world, the realm of human existence, from its normal, natural ruin. The fact that newborns constantly come to the world does not only explain how the new is possible, but also why and how plurality comes about. What Arendt does not sufficiently emphasize, in my view, is that this also explains why we are fit for political life from the very beginning. This is to a great extent due to the fact that Arendt, with her interpretation of the Greek model, defined politics as the sphere of speech and action that is opposed to that of the oikos, the household, where the basic needs for the substances of life are provided. For her, the emergence of political modernity and thus of the, the problem of needs marks the end of politics, not its beginning. Modernity is the moment when politics is eclipsed by the social, when the question of the conservation of life come at the center of politics. For her, debate, not satisfaction of needs, is the very stuff political life is made of. And it is not by chance that Arendt interprets Aristotle's definition of man as zone politicon as strictly linked to his other definition of man as zone logon econ, 
as the living being that possesses the logos. <coughs> Driven by this definition of politics, Arendt could never have accepted the expression biopolitics, even less so the idea that politics is always biopolitical. Hence, the paradox we noted above, one of the most inspiring philosophers for thinking about biopolitics, at least in my view, would have never used the, this expression unless to sharply criticize it. This has, in my view, also prevented Arendt from realizing that since its very birth, politics has always been biopolitical. This is not only because, in contrast to what she seems to assume, the term politics is a recent invention, very much linked to the emergence of the modern sovereign state. Politics has always been biopolitical because in whatever way we want to conceive of it, it is our existence as living beings who have been born that is in question. To put it bluntly, politics is biopolitical because it is genopolitics well before being thanatopolitics. Genopolitics being a term that I coined by um, joining to get together genia, the Greek term for birth, with politics. So, gena, gena politics instead of thanato politics. At this point of the argument, one may rightly ask, why, if politics has always been biopolitical, did this term emerge only now? One reason is the rapidly transforming capitalism tendency to intensify the link between politics and life. Through the technological development of the past half century and the incorporation of life in the mechanism of capitalist production itself, human beings have become able to penetrate the inner mechanism of life in a way that has never been the case before. I cannot deal with those transformations <coughs> now, but other people will do it uh, in this conference, so I leave it to them. Let me just say that it is because of the transformation of contemporary capitalism that literally today, not only death, but also life itself can be inflicted by political power. Hence, the term biopolitics emerges to signify the appropriation by the state of the power over biological life. Just as the birth of modern state gave to politics an autonomy that it, ne that it didn't have before, to such an extent that a new term was needed, politics. So, equally, the capitalist transformation we are meet witnessing have made of life itself such a crucial political problem that a new word was needed, biopolitics. In conclusion, life has always been crucial to politics, but never to the degree that it is today. And it is to see such a novelty as well as the failure of the available vocabulary to designate this fact that a new term has emerged. Like Mephistopheles said in the quotation at the beginning, good and neat. The fact that it is the technological development of late capitalism that have given life such a crucial position also points to the fact that better life never existed for us. Agamben is wrong in saying that biopolitics begins, with, begins when we, are, we can no longer distinguish between zoe and bios, between bare life and qualified life, because bare life has actually never been accessible to us. Or better, life, let alone the place that it <coughs> occupies in politics, is inseparable from the image that we have of it. And here we can begin to see why biopolitics is also, in my view, imaginal politics. Our being in common is always mediated by images, well, before being mediated by words, by the logos, as I to have it. In other words, we are zoi politikoi, political living beings, because we are, at the same time, and in that very moment, also imaginal beings. But this is the topic for another paper, maybe even maybe even for a whole book. Thank you. <laughs>
Did you want to say something? No, 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 no. Okay. Then no, I'm with. Um, first place, I really, I really enjoyed the, um, the connection between mentality and the biopolitics. I mean, I'm very sympathetic. I think we agree. I just have a small. Um, it's not even an objection, but it might be a complication on the claim that politics has always been biopolitics. And I wonder what you'd say about that. I'm not sure what um, difference it would make to your major position. Um, and the question is this, I don't think, I mean, I don't think that politics has always been biopolitics. It may have been for Aristotle. I don't think it was for Hobbes and Spinoza, who I don't think took us to be animals, um, living animals, as you suggest, but rather automatic. Um, the, the mechanistic understanding of men and society was the predominant one. Um, the, the mechanistic model of explaining everything was the predominant one. And understanding that politics has to be done. Um, the explanation of politics and the political body itself has to be understood as the predominant. In Spinoza, I mean, you know, I know most of it. But in Spinoza, I'm definitely willing to say there is no such a thing as mentality. Um, there is no such, I mean, he would grant that people are being born, but he would deny that this is life. Um, coming into being, um, as in something that has not existed, um, now exists. Mm. That a self, say, that a person, that did not exist now exists. Um, this is the same in Leibniz, um, for the very same reasons you see in um, Spinoza. By the way, that is also the mind death, uh, similar, for similar reasons. The notion of life becomes a, a meaningful um, um, category in general. And then I take it for politics. For us, later than those thinkers, maybe this includes some kind of a return to a more uh, Aristotelian tradition that was unavailable. So I wonder what to, I mean, so in that sense, bi politics was not always biopolitics. It's something new. In the no, it's interesting what you say. I mean, my argument is certainly that to a minimal degree, politics has always been biopolitical because it has always have to do with life. I mean, whether Hobbes' uh, conceptual philosophical framework was able to grasp this fact or not. Uh, so it's two different claims, right? Um, but it's interesting that he, I, I agree with you uh, for Hobbes, the human being with, being just automata. Uh, but I don't agree with Spinoza. I mean, like, it, well, we have an endless discussion. We don't agree with Spinoza. Your interpretation of Spinoza. Today, would you? Spinoza. Are you telling me that come into being, but uh, there was at some point there was nothing. At some other point there was something. This is an. This is an. It comes in later. But let's begin with the automata. Like maybe this is a lot too long of a conversation. Okay. Uh, I try to um, you know respond in a, in a, in a few with a few words. I don't think that Spinoza's human beings are Hobbes automata. Not at all. I mean, rather on the contrary, I think that. Spinoza's materialism is a, is a vitalistic materialism, like very much so. So, uh, particularly when it comes to politics, like um, I, I don't see this m mechanistic view of politics uh, as simply an automata, right? Uh, sure. Nature well, is, or the problem. The problem is uh, there's not so much space for natality. Uh, for thinking about natality, if you want, in the Arantian term, as an absolute beginning, I don't want to think about natality in those, necessarily in those terms, because, of course, there is the substance and monism. But I think the space in Spinoza for thinking about natality, as much as there is space for thinking about death, in the sense of transformation. I mean, the fifth part of the ethics. Yeah, okay. We're not going to have to did this, I'm thinking of the, the beginning of the Strauss's essay on what is political philosophy. He says we have a problem of translating the word politia, and that problem is linked to positivism and the social sciences. And the four makes exactly this, a very similar argument in the permanence of the theological political. And there's an idea, there, it's certainly in the four, there's, a, there's an idea of a kind of 
occultation of the symbolic structure of politics. And I wonder if I'm inclined to think, in a certain sense, the emergence of biopolitics as a kind of reemergence of this occultation of the symbolic aspect of politics. And particularly with Agamben, where there, there's a kind of politics of the real, uh, of, of bare life. And I, I, I'm just wondering how you do you see a kind of tension within these two dimensions of contemporary political philosophy. I, I, I certainly do, if you take Agamben uh, version, I mean, with the emphasis on bare life, uh, as something that is uh, distinguished from uh, um, qualified life. But, but as I guess it should be clear by now, uh, I think there's a way of thinking about uh, biopolitics uh, as actually a way to emphasize and bring back the symbolic dimension. Uh, I've been, uh, to, to, uh, to put it in a, in a kind of a joke, I've been uh, discussing with uh, Simona many times, why are there so many Italians writing about biopolitics? Like, Agamben, Esposito, Negri, right? Why, why did we have to invite so many Italians to this conference? And uh, I think the... The dead. It's a low birth. No, it's because we have the Vatican. If, if there, is, there are people who have a lot of, who make a lot of symbolic, uh, let's say, undertones to life itself, these are, you know, uh, the Vatican. So I don't think there is... I think you're right with uh, the Agamben uh, version. And the reason is because they read French. And the influence of Foucault on Italy. Beyond the map. Yes, okay. So um, I guess my question uh, concerns your introduction of this new term, general politics. Uh, so Speak a little louder. Sorry. Okay, so uh, my question concerns your introduction of this new term, uh, general politics. So this identification of biopolitics and thanatopolitics is basically Agamben's business, right? Yeah. Uh, because he thinks that uh, the, the camp is the normos of modernity and so on. And um, when, when you look at, at Foucault's understanding of uh, biopolitics, birth, birth rates, uh, the obsession with, uh, with sexuality um, as a, a behavior leading to reproduction, um, all of that was, was already present in, in his understanding of biopolitics as well as the camps, right, the death camps. And, um, and of course, I mean, it, it, it led to, to further work on, on uh, practices related to birth, such as Susan Greenhalgh's work on, work on the one-child policy in China, for example. And um, I wonder, I mean, I, 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 I don't think that Agamben's um, sort of reduction of biopolitics to thanatopolitics was a very smart move. Um, and it, 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 it certainly excluded a whole lot of, of things from the picture. And if, if you sort of, I'm, I'm not sure sort of what the status of, of your genome politics would be, but if, it's, if it would have the same status as Agamben's thanatopolitics, then I think I would challenge it. And, and would wonder what, what, what you think is gained that way. And the other point is that you said uh, a couple of times that uh, the Greeks might have uh, the thing but not a name. Uh, but of course, one point that one can learn from Foucault is that knowledge changes uh, uh, sort of power practices. And, um, and I mean, when I, I guess the question would be when you look at, at, um, at uh, the, the, the way in which the Greek polis was run, then uh, you, know, you, you won't find the kind of practices that uh, aim at controlling, um, say, reproduction or demographics. Or, and, and of course, the basis for that is that you have to know something about it in the first place. You need statistics about it, and, and then you introduce new forms of political intervention, such as I don't know, giving tax breaks to people with children or, you know, things that sort of will modify their behavior. And that means that if you name it differently and if you know something else about it, uh, you will also treat it differently politically. And I mean, I, I guess that was the whole point in, in Foucault arguing that uh, biopolitics is a new phenomenon. And from that perspective, I guess one could also question whether one can trace biopolitics all the way back 
up to antiquity the way that Agamben does and, and the way that you do. Yes, I'm not sure why your uh, second uh, consideration would be against what I'm saying. But um, okay, beginning with the first one, the, the implication of uh, what are the the implication of uh, this emphasis on uh, Gen or Gena politics. Um, I, I agree with you. I mean, certainly, um, certainly Agamben uh, exacerbate the thanatopolitical um, reading version of biopolitics, but I think it's already there in Foucault. I mean, in Foucault, uh, sure, there's, a, there's an emphasis on rate, birth rate, but there's not, birth is not really a philosophical category for him. I mean, despite the fact that, you know, birth uh, figures in, in many titles of his book. Uh, and it's not by chance that uh, the reflection on, on, on birth rates is, goes together with the death camp. Uh, and that, um, in a way, uh, for uh, um, and I think there for both racism and Nazism in both readings can be seen as um, the culminating point of the biopolitical turn precisely because I mean it, it is there where life is read in terms of the possibility of death like what would it mean for to take uh, the Ghana politics seriously would be to start of thinking as uh, um, birth as the central political category par excellence, but it would also mean instead of keep thinking about the extermination camp as the culminating or you know the symbolic place where we see mm -hmm. the biopolitical turn of modernity, you know, let's take the birth room, like or labor room. I do say um, Labor, labor, right? Yeah, this is what I want. Like, I, I want more philosophy. There are a lot of empirical studies done on the birth, right? But there's not much philosophical. If you compare the number of works from Agamben, Negri, uh, even Esposito, uh, done on uh, biopolitics in the perspective of we being 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 towards death. There's very little which has been done uh, on, uh, you know, on biopolitics from the perspective, the philosophical perspective of human beings as beings after birth. So if you want it, it's, it's, a, it's a, philo a, a change in the philosophical perspective, right? Again to just few sentences. I think that at stake here, more than the term politics, is the term life. So, uh, and what does life mean? In the sense that in, uh, in the Foucault uh, meaning of biopolitics, life is not uh, simple, neither in the general sense of being or being born, nor of existence, by life in the biological sense as an object of politics. So I think that the, 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 the old misunderstandings in biopolitics are based on the meaning of the term life, which is which has not one only meaning. But I think we can't get rid of it. <laughs> yes, but <laughs> we can't get rid of it precisely because there's not such a thing as bare life. Like no. maybe there is, but we can't name it. We can't perceive it. Like wh what is bare? What is a life? That is not no, bear life, already interpreted. No. But bare life is not the same of biological life. That's the point. Anyway, may I? No. Yeah. <laughs> okay, on the other hand, yeah. I mean, it's, it's almost a question Thought of. Thought was uh, already. Yeah. The question of representation and definition. Because does it exist something like bare life? Because bare life is not a fact, bare life is an interpretation of a yeah, fact. Exactly. And this is also for automata. Of course, to say that life is a life of being war automata, or to, to, to say that uh, life is mechanical, is just the uh, 17th century representation of life. So we are never uh, dealing with life uh, um, intending as concrete and so universal and out of dispute in fact. We are, of course, all of us dealing with representation of life, representation of politics. So I agree with, with Simona, but I agree also, also with, with, uh, with Chiara. 
when, when you propose a, a, a politics of birth or a game of politics, uh, what I catch of your, of your paper, which I like very much, is what you, you propose is, is something dealing with a certain representation of birth or interpretation of birth, like in a rent. She was not concerned at all with birth. She never gave birth, in my opinion. She, she hated the child, the infant, so it's a very strange concept of birth that she had. But of course, for, according to her aunt, birth was the beginning, birth was the, uh, the givenness of the, of the newborn, it was uh, the appearing of uniqueness. So this is the perspective, not on birth as a fact, but on interpretations of birth. So I agree with you. Good. Because uh, I take it from you, so you better agree with me. <laughs> <Miguel. laughs> um, just a, a very quick remark on, on one of your remarks in response to the previous question, where you said that birth is not a philosophical category for Foucault. Probably not, certainly not a metaphysical category, so, but what is it in Foucault? I doubt, I doubt there's anything that would count as a metaphysical category, if, with the exception perhaps of what he says in relation to Nietzsche in that sort of first lecture course at the Collège de France on, on the will to know. But it is a philosophical category in the sense that who more than him after Nietzsche was interested in genealogy, exactly. in archaeology, in the birth of the clinic, the birth of biopolitics. There's a whole conception of history that is concerned with uh, a, a moment, as he says, in connection with Nietzsche, of Ursprung of Entstehung, and he tried to make those very different, sort of um, differentiated um, remarks regarding the various senses of, of birth. And it's a very different conception of history than, say, the Heideggerian one, which indeed is uh, derived from our relation to the future. So his whole critical uh, relation to the present, including the biopolitical present, has to do with the possibility of engaging with something like no, birth. But, but, but you see yeah. how disembodied yeah. this birth is. Yeah. Like, oh. No. Oh. Well, that's going a bit slow. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to. You want to say more to, to this question? No. no. Let's <laughs> collect it. I think we have to, to, we okay, have well, to let's collect. Just, and okay. and now, let's just, get just two more questions. Because it's like two or so it's yeah, um, Chiara, I have uh, two points really that I want to make. Uh, the first point, I was a little bit confused. Uh, in your paper, you seem to construe Foucault and Agambe um, pretty much locating uh, biopolitics at the dawn of modernity. My reading of Agamben is precisely that uh, Agamben traces it back to the origin of politics in the Greek polis um, because he wants to show its relationship not in opposition to sovereignty, but as a fundamental product of sovereignty. So if, if, so in that sense, for Agamben, it is not so much the, the uh, entry of life into politics with modernity as it is for Foucault, but what he says, the indistinguishability between bare life and uh, political life. So and in that sense, that is, for him, specifically modern. So um, on the one hand, there's an operation in Agama that transhistoricalizes biopolitics. And in the second, uh, at the same time, he, he inscribes biopolitics in, a, in modernity through the argument of indistinguishability, which is tied for him to the becoming of the norm of the state of exception. So, so which is largely absent from Foucault, the, the state of exception structure. So if we granted the, the separation, especially in terms of the historicization and with all their con theoretical consequences between Foucault and Agamben, um, I, I'm, uh, I'm sort of curious how then uh, you would position your own argument with respect to uh, that differentiation, because it seemed to me that you seemed actually closer than Agamben that you would care to admit in the sense that you do also want to locate biopolitics in the origin, or at least in the Athenian um, model. So, so this is one point. And the second point I have is, um, while I understand the, the, at least the political uh, meaning of the reversal, of your desire to reverse the Thanato politics into uh, what you call the Geno politics, um, uh, from death, the focus from death to birth, um, I, I do understand that. Um, and perhaps it is true that because women have not been 
part of the philosophical canon that Burke has not been uh, emphasized uh, as a, a point of philosophical inquiry. However, I also wanted to uh, question, is it possible also that because the fact of being born is something that actually has no agency, we do not decide on our birth, right? we are just born, other people decide it for us, whereas death or how we live until our death is something precisely on which we can uh, exercise our agency. So I wonder if, in addition to the, the gender dimension of uh, those who actually do philosophical meditation, might this also not be the reason why politics has been oriented toward death or the preservation of life vis-a-vis -vis death rather than on mentality? <laughs> Okay, no, this is very interesting, um, both, both things you said. Um, Miguel disappeared, so I'll skip uh, this question. Um, about the first, I have to think more about it. Honestly, uh, maybe I'm closer to a gamble than I think I am. Uh, I, ju I just, I could never buy the idea that the concentration camp is the, the epitome of the biopolitical term. Um, so, and, and in this sense, I do think that his version of the biopolitics is, is too much thanatopolitical for, for my taste. But maybe you're right in what you say in terms of, and I also tend to, have, maybe you have a different reading, I, I tend to see as uh, Hobbes uh, in his thinking to be really crucial and like making uh, a, a significant um, step, right? Uh, but I have to think more about it. We will have a chance to discuss this. Uh, your second remark, it, it's very interesting because um, you know, I'm thinking myself uh, about this issue. This is a, a whole new, new project. Um, probably you're right. I mean, it's not just a question of gender, but also a question of the way we relate to birth, right? We, we don't ex exercise our own agency uh, on birth. But nevertheless, the question still remains, why do we only have to philosophize about things we can actually control? I mean, is there no way to think about having philosophical reflections or uh, look philosophically at things where we have no agency? Why Theology. is that? I think not theology. <laughs> that's something on which we do not control. Yeah. Yeah. Look, uh, we're going, we have two days, and there'll be plenty of chance to change, and I think that we're going to have to, uh, not death, but we'll, let, we'll, 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 we'll have a new beginning. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs>